Hello guys, welcome to Dr. Sam's Anatomy Classes. Here I'm going to solve this question paper of anatomy of Atal Bihari Vajpayee Medical University of Lucknow. This question paper is of MBBS first professional examination which was held in January 2023 for students admitted in 2021. This was the main exam. And this question paper is anatomy paper 1. And here you're seeing is part 1 of paper 1, which is of 50 marks. Including part 2, it will become a paper of 100 marks. So here in this question paper, you are seeing the pattern. There is a long clinical structured question, which is of 15 marks. Then there are short note questions where you have to write within 500 words. And that is of 5 each that makes 15 marks and then short answer questions where you have to write less than 100 words 5 questions 2 marks each is 10 marks and lastly you have 10 mcqs which make 10 marks so together you are seeing that this paper 1 part 1 is of 50 marks now let's begin with the questions question number 1 here is a long answer question where it's expected that you write the details of each and everything whatever has been asked so let's read out the question first. A 12 year old boy came in OPD with complaint of unilateral, firm, warm, painful swelling of the cheek. Clinician observed that the swelling was located between the ear and the angle of the jaw and was extremely painful. Here they have not mentioned about the side of the swelling, but I think that doesn't matter because there is nothing relevant that they have asked with the side of the swelling. Ideally, they should have mentioned the side of the swelling because it is always mentioned whenever you have a unilateral swelling, the side has to be mentioned. He made a clinical diagnosis of parotitis. Answer the below mentioned questions. So first of all, what is your impression? What have you concluded from the question? One thing is unilateral that you understand firm with firm. You actually get to know either it might be a carcinoma or it might be covered by a tense fibrous tissue or the inflammation might be so much that it is bulging the capsule of the parotid gland making it tense warm warm actually is a sign which denotes generally the infection painful denotes that there is something which is stretching the nerve endings now let's read the questions what is the anatomical reason of extreme pain in parotid inflammation for this, you should know that the parotid gland is invested or enclosed within the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. And not only this parotid, the submandibular gland there that also is invested within this investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. And this investing layer, you know, is attached to the margins of the mandible and down below to the clavicle, the suprasternal notch, and it invests the two muscles, sternocleidomastoid, trapezius. Just because I'm telling you about this investing layer of the deep cervical fascia, remember four important points about this investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. One thing is it invests two muscles, sternocleidomastoid and trapezius. It invests two glands, parotid gland and some mandibular salivary gland. It encloses two spaces there's a space that it forms above the suprasternal notch and that is called space of burn and it also forms a space above to the clavicles then it also forms two pulleys one is the pulley for the digastric and one is the pulley for the omohyde okay now because it's investing parotid glands so the parenchyma of the parotid gland is t-third is attached firmly to the undersurface of the capsule, especially the part of the capsule which covers the outer surface of the parotid gland. And this capsule which is formed by the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia is having the same nerve supply as the skin covering it, right? And that is from the great auricular nerve. So because when the mandible moves, the fascia actually stretches and with that it causes pain. And also because even in a resting stage, if there is tremendous growth of the parotid gland from within, it also will cause stretching of the fascia covering it. And that fascia contains the nerve endings or the pain receptors and that pain is being carried by the great auricular nerve. 
So that's the reason of extreme pain in parotitis. Similar such reasons you will find in case of otitis externa. There also, if there is a boil or any pustules on the pinna, that also is really painful. And for similar reason, you'll find if there is any pus or any pustules or boils onto the nose, the external nose. And similar reasons you will find for perianal abscess. All these sites, you find the reason of pain is stretching of the fascial tissue which are innovated by pain carrying sensory fibers. Next is write note on surface and relations of parotid gland. This I'm not going to explain you because it's very well given in the books. It needs to draw a lot of diagrams in this for showing all the relations of the parotid gland. This you can read from the book. The next is describe in detail the secretomotor pathway of parotid gland via otic ganglion. So if they mentioned part of the pathway that it is through the otic ganglion. So that's a hint if you have studied about the otic ganglion and the secretomotor pathway, you can write it easily. Once again, I'm making you revise. So remember that the secretomotor pathway begins from the inferior salivatory nucleus from where the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers begin and they pass on via the glossopharyngeal nerve and through the tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve, they enter the middle ear. They form a tympanic plexus there. And from this tympanic plexus, there is this lesser petrosal nerve which comes out through the hiatus for the lesser petrosal nerve on the tegment tympani, that is the anterior wall of the petrous temporal bone and then moves downwards and medially to reach towards the foramen ovale. From there, this descends down and joins this otic ganglion. And from there, the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers, they run along the auriculotemporal nerve to reach the parotid gland, where they act upon the myoepithelial cells surrounding to the SNI of this gland to cause salivary secretions. Next is describe course and branches of the facial nerve within parotid gland. This also has to be described in detail with a lot of good diagrams. All this is given in detail in your books. So read it from the books. Next is question number two, where you have to write short notes on these three questions, which are of five marks each. One is lacrimal apparatus. So this is given there in all the books with diagrams also. You can learn it from there. Next is cavernous sinus and its applied anatomy. Super important question. This also is very important and quite often asked in your exam. So make sure you should prepare this question very well. Next is question number 2C. Development of neural tube and neural tube defects. Now, this is a question from embryology section. We have to describe the neural tube and its neural tube defects. This also you can read from the book. The neural tube defects, I'm just telling you that generally the common new neural tube defects are because of the failure of closure of the anterior and the posterior end of the neural tube. That's the anterior or the rostral neuropore, which if fails to close that will lead to anencephaly and the posterior end or the caudal end of the neuropore if it fails to close it will lead to spina bifida if you have time you can describe all the different types of spina bifida also here you should also mention about the dates of the closure of these two neuropores remember the anterior neuropore is first to close anterior or the rostral neuropore and that closes around the 25th day of intrauterine life sometimes in an mc they've written 26 then also it's not wrong remember it actually should close before 26th day so generally the most common date is 25th day of intrauterine life that's the day of closure of anterior neuropore and the posterior neuropore actually should close before the end of the fourth week so if they ask for a day, specific day, then it's 28th day of intrauterine life. To help you remember these two days, I can help you to remember another fact with this. 
So remember, there is very commonly asked question that which of the two limb buds appear first, either the upper limb buds or the lower limb buds. So remember that the upper limb buds are first to appear and that also appear by around 26th day of interuterine life and the lower limb buds appear by around 28th day of interuterine life. So with this, you can remember the closure of the two neuropores anterior neuropore 25th to 26th day and posterior neuropore around 28th day of interuterine life. Remember what I am telling is not enough. I am just mentioning the important points which I can recollect right now in this short video. The video becomes long if I am going to express each and everything. So make sure you are going to read all these topics from the book. Now question number 3 is short answer questions where you have to write less than 100 words. Here the first question is write in brief, the arterial supply of thyroid gland, a very simple and easy question you must be knowing. There are mainly two arteries, superior thyroidal artery, which is a branch from external carotid artery. Inferior thyroid artery is a branch from thyrocervical trunk, which is the branch from the first part of the subclavian artery. And there's sometimes another small artery reaching to supply the asthmus of thyroid gland that is a branch from the arch of aorta itself or sometimes from the brachiocephalic trunk. You can read it further from the book. Explain why infection is more common in the metaphyseal region of a growing long bone. So this you must be knowing if you know the blood supply of a long bone, there is a nutritional foramen from where the nutritional artery enters into the cortical portion of a bone that's called the diaphysis where there is herbation system, Wachmann's canal, right? So through those, these branches, they ascend up and they reach towards this metaphysis and at the metaphysis they take a u-shaped turn that is called the hairpin capillary pattern of capillaries at the metaphysis so because of that u-shaped curved root of these vessels in the metaphysis in case of bacteremia in case of bacteria in the blood will settle down there at the turning points of the vessels leading to colonization of bacteria Right, so that is a common cause for infection at the metaphysis. Now, what is Kilans dehiscence and its clinical significance? So, Kilans dehiscence, you know, it's a triangular area in the wall of the pharynx between cricopharynges and thyropharynges. Like these are the two parts of the inferior constrictors. So, there's a gap between, and that's called Kilans dehiscence. Now regarding clinical significance, you can write it represents a potentially weak point here. So where you can see a pharyngoesophageal diverticulum coming out right? and that's called Zinker's diverticulum. So this diverticulosis is common to occur here at Kilans dehiscence because that's a weak point or a weak triangular area in the wall of the pharynx. Next question is enumerate the muscles of mastication because it's a two marks question right so here you just have to enumerate the muscles and those are temporalis masseter and medial and lateral pterygoid muscles you can add up that accessory muscle of mastication is buccinator because it pushes the food from the gingobuccal fold and gingolabial fold into the oral cavity between the teeth next question is enumerate the branches of external carotid artery you just have to enumerate the names so the better way is you can elaborate them by writing that there are eight branches and few are the anterior branches. Actually, there are three anterior branches, two posterior branches, a medial branch and the two are the terminal branches. So anterior branches from below above, these are superthyroidal artery, lingual artery, facial artery, then posterior from below above are posterior auricular then occipital artery and the medial side it's ascending pharyngeal artery and the terminal ones are the maxillary artery and superficial temporal artery now talking about question number four that includes 10 mcqs so mcq number one safety muscle of larynx is lateral cricoaretinoid posterior cricoaretinoid transverse arytenoid or thyroaretinoid so here you know that posterior cricoarytenoid this muscle here is the only abductor of the vocal cords so it abducts the vocal cords and thereby it opens the rima glottitis thereby making the airway patent so it's a must for the integrity of this muscle therefore it is a safety muscle which maintains the airways by abducting the vocal cords 
However, there is another muscle which is antagonizing its action and that is lateral cricoarytenoid muscle which actually adducts the vocal cords thereby protecting the airway by closing it in case of any foreign particle which goes inside the larynx so it adducts and closes the airway passage so that actually is a protective mechanism but for the safety muscle if they ask then it is posterior cricoarytenoid question number 2 coracoid process of scapula is an example of pressure epiphysis traction epiphysis atavistic epiphysis aberrant epiphysis so this question is from general anatomy portion pressure epiphysis you know are along the longitudinal axis of the bone which undergo pressure during joint movements like the upper end of humerus upper end of femur lower end of femur upper end of tibia these are the condylar ends so they are the example of pressure epiphysis traction epiphysis is the portion of a bone where group of muscles or a muscle is attached and because of the traction upon that portion of a bone there is additional epiphysis being formed that's called a secondary epiphysis because of the secondary ossification centers such examples are lesser and greater tubercles of humerus medial lateral epicondyles of humerus now atavistic epiphysis are basically those bones which were a separate bones in primitive vertebrates now they have been fused to the main bone or the adjoining bone in us in humans in homo sapiens sapiens such bones are examples of atavistic epiphysis example is coracoid process of scapula as well as os trigonum that is a tubercle on the posterior aspect of talus laterally attached so it's a lateral tubercle on the posterior aspect of the talus called os trigonum that also is an example of atavistic epiphysis aberrant epiphysis are which are not normally present but may be present sometimes like the secondary ossification center for the first metacarpal normally should be towards the base of the first metacarpal and even in case of first metatarsal but if it also appears towards the distal end of the first metacarpal and metatarsal then it's an example of aberrant epiphysis next question number 3 taste from the anterior two third of the tongue is taken by facial nerve glossopharyngeal nerve hypoglossal nerve vagus nerve so you know from the anterior two third of the tongue including the taste sensation from the hard palate they being carried by facial nerve actually that's a branch from the facial nerve which carries taste sensation from the anterior two third of the tongue and that is coda tympani and from the hard palate it is through the greater petrosal nerve so both greater petrosal nerve and coda tympani are branches of facial nerve and from the posterior one third of the tongue including the circumvallate papillae the taste sensation is being carried by glossopharyngeal nerve and from the posterior most portion of the tongue that includes vallicula as well so taste from there even including the epiglottis the taste sensations are being carried by vagus nerve otherwise if you talk about the general sensations from the anterior to third it is through the lingual nerve which is a branch from mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve then from the posterior one third of the tongue general sensations being carried by glossopharyngeal nerve and from the posterior most portion of the tongue general sensations are also being carried by vagus nerve and the motor nerve supply for the tongue is hypoglossal nerve 8 plus 8 16 muscles of the tongue out of which four paired muscles are extrinsic and four paired muscles are intrinsic you know that hyoglossus palatoglossus tyloglossus genoglossus the intrinsic muscles are the superior longitudinal inferior longitudinal vertical and transverse all these are innervated by hypoglossal nerve except the palatoglossus now this palatoglossal is innervated by vago accessory nerve complex a question number 4 symphysis pubis is a variety of primary cartilaginous joint secondary cartilaginous joint synovial joint both a and c so remember whenever they use this word symphysis it actually means the secondary cartilaginous joint so symphysis pubis manubrosternal joint then the intervertebral joint between the body of vertebrae all are example of secondary cartilaginous joint they are also called symphysis remember the primary cartilaginous joints are called synchondrosis question number 5 in 32 days menstrual cycle ovulation occurs at 14th day 18th day 22nd day 24th day so remember out of that menstrual cycle the if it's like 28 day or 30 days or 32 days remember this midway of the cycle is ovulation
and here it's the start of bleeding start of bleeding and here it's the last day of bleeding so from ovulation to the onset of bleeding this period is of 14 days which is fixed this period is fixed which is the secretive phase of the endometrial cycle so after ovulation remember there are countable 14 days for the start of bleeding of menstrual cycle right this period is fixed so you can minus 32 minus 14 will give you 18 days that's the answer here so in 32 days ovulation will occur at 18th day question number six surgical layers of the scalp include all except skin connective tissue layer upper neurotic layer loose areolar tissue layer so these are one two three four layers and the fifth layer is the periosteum or the pericranial layer so those are the five layers out of these remember the upper three layers these three layers are actually called the scalp proper so whenever you dissect or whenever you give an incision these three layers are split open remember the skin is joined below to the aponeurotic layer with the help of connective tissue layers so these three layers are tethered together you cannot like easily separate them but the fourth layer is a gap in between the third and the fifth layer which is filled by loose areolar connected tissue and there are emissary veins traversing so remember and this loose areolar tissue the fourth layer actually has no bony attached in the front so in case of emissary veins if they rupture the bleeding will descend down to the eyelids causing a black eye because the anterior fibers of this frontalis muscle has no bony attachments it is attached to the upper margin of the tarsal plate so all this is just the clinical things which i have just reminding you otherwise remember the top three layers are called the skull proper so these are the surgical layers of the scalp and they have asked is all except so the answer here will be loose areolar tissue question number seven all supplied by mandibular nerve except medial pterygoid lateral pterygoid posterior belly of diagastric anterior belly of diagastric remember that all the muscles of mastication they are innovated by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve that includes medial and lateral pterygoids as well as masseter and temporalis however there's a branch that's called nerve to mylohyoid that's a branch from the mandibular nerve and that also supplies mylohyoid as well as anterior belly of the digastric. All these muscles are derived from the first pharyngeal arch. However, posterior belly of digastric is derived from the second pharyngeal arch and it is innervated by the posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve. So the answer here is C, posterior belly of digastric. Question number eight, Little's area is anastomosis of all arteries except lesser palatine artery, greater palatine artery, anterior ethmoidal artery posterior ethmoidal artery so remember the littles area is present there on the nasal septum and that plexus the arterial plexus formed is called kieselbach's plexus and the arteries contributing in this anastomosis are the greater palatine artery anterior ethmoidal artery posterior ethmoidal artery superior labial branches from the facial artery as well as the sphenopalatine artery which is the branch from maxillary artery even greater palatine artery is also branch from maxillary artery actually the number of arteries participating in this little area are the b c and d options and you can include sphenopalatine as well as the superior label branches on the facial artery so, right so these five arteries you should mention in case of little's area anastomosis so the answer here is lesser palatine artery this lesser palatine artery is a branch of descending palatine artery and it supplies palatine tonsils and the soft palate not reaching up to the little area. Question number 9. Oculomotor nerve supplies all except inferior rectus, superior rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus. So it's so easy question because you know LR6 means the abducent nerve supplies the lateral rectus and SO4 that means superior oblique is supplied by trochlear nerve the rest all of the extraocular muscles they are innovated by oculomotor nerve the next question is most common cause of bleeding after tonsillectomy actually they have mentioned is all the vessels in the options which is not exactly the cause because the question is most common cause 
the cause is the sloughing of the ischar like the scab tissue from the operated area so in case of like any instrumentation or maybe like ingestion of solid food or due to dehydration there might be sloughing of the ischar tissue so that is actually a cause of post operative bleeding but here because they have mentioned is the names of vessels arteries and veins so that means they're talking is about the hemorrhage the post operative hemorrhage which may be due to pseudo aneurysm of facial artery which is common here right so pseudo aneurysm of the facial artery is one of the common causes of bleeding after tonsillectomy so you can remember that the answer here will be tonsillar branch of the facial artery and the endovascular embolization of this artery has proved to be a valuable treatment option for this type of life threatening problem so it is done